want to uh, share with you today some thoughts about how we can achieve digital inclusion in our city and across our state. But I first want to say, um, as I began, began to prepare for this talk, I, I realized I was, I was kind of taken back to what it was like in junior high uh, when I was preparing for that first speech of my, uh, my life, which was uh, I was running for student council treasurer in my junior high school. And, and the awesome experience of being here and t speaking in front of all of you has kind of been like that. Uh, I speak in front of groups all the time, but uh, I don't know, the anxiety this week has just been higher than, uh, than usual. So uh, I hope that you'll bear with me and uh, we'll, make this through, we'll make this through together. I want to talk today about how can we achieve digital inclusion. I want to talk about what it is and, and how we can do it. What are some things, what are th some of the characteristics of it in our city, etc. So to start with, what I'd like to do is to share with you a story, a story about a trip that I made to Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire is the Ivory Coast. It's over there in West Africa. And I was there with a group. We were handing out uh, mosquito nets or delivering mosquito nets uh, to help with the situation of malaria. And one of the things that we did in each of those, as we went to each village, is that we would visit with the village chief. And as we visited with the village chief, uh, one of the things that we would do is uh, get the village chief uh, to, uh, uh, you know, kind of bless the effort and so forth and so on. And so we're sitting there with the village chief, and, and while I'm sitting there with the village chief talking about this effort to uh, reduce malaria in the village and everything, I watch his grandchildren uh, catch a chicken. I watch them kill the chicken, uh, and then I watch them uh, plunge the chicken in a pot of boiling water. And this, this is their kitchen here. Uh, watch them uh, then pluck the chicken, and so at the end of our visit, uh, I take a picture of them with their newly plucked chicken. Uh, but the reason I share that picture with you is that during the course of that uh, event as well, the chief got a call on his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I discovered about Cote d'Ivoire, the, one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, is that Everybody had a cell phone. So let me take you to the next slide uh, and uh, share with you a little bit about that. Everybody in Cote d'Ivoire had a cell phone. This was their primary way of communicating. Uh, they did, uh, made phone calls. They did text messages and so forth and so on. Uh, and, um, and all over the city there were places to transfer or to um, uh, uh, charge your cell phone and uh, not charge it, but uh, get, get minutes upgraded and so forth and so on. And so... Um, I looked through all my pictures of Cote d'Ivoire and I could not find a picture of, of one of these places where you could go and recharge your cell phone with minutes. And I finally came across this particular picture, uh, which is a tire store along the road in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. And if you can, it's kind of hard to see, but up there in the very corner, you, it, in French, I'm not, I don't speak French. Does anyone speak French in here? It says, transfert de units, something like that. What that means is that the guy that owned the tire store, uh, tire repair shop right here on the road in, uh, in Abidjan was also in the business of recharging people's cell phones. So cell phones are an important part of communicating there in Cote d'Ivoire. Now the other thing that is interesting about Cote d'Ivoire is that, um, you know, some of you may know that Cote d'Ivoire was a place uh, recently that had a uh, presidential election that was uh, disputed. Uh, and so one of the things that happened during that four-month period of time when the disputed election was taking place is that I was receiving emails and Facebook, uh, Facebook updates from people in Cote d'Ivoire that I met while I was there, and they were doing that, of course, on their cell phones, that they were recharging in places like this. So let me go to the next slide uh, and ask you as a group, how many of you in this room do not have a smartphone? A few of you, not very many of you, not very many of you. Uh, you know, we take all kinds of things for granted. Uh, you know, in our homes we have, uh, many of us have ubiquitous Wi-Fi because it's in the house, it's outside the house, it's our next door neighbors who have an unsecured uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> signal. Uh, you know, it's all over the place. Uh, and we have our, our laptops and we have our tablet PCs and uh, we have our digital readers. We have all this stuff that we take for granted. It's a, it's a part of our everyday existence. And, and you know, as I, was, I was sitting up there in the top and watching several of the other speakers, one of the things that 
that you have an advantage when you sit near the top of the, the place here is that you can look down and you can see everybody checking their Facebook updates and uh, doing email and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's going on. It's going on. So, um, but this is something that we take for granted, isn't it? But what about, um, you know, we have, um, we have connectivity. Uh, we have the devices. We have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to, to use all those devices. But, but what about the folks that don't? What about the rest of us? What about the folks that don't have some combination of those three things? Devices, connectivity, and the knowledge, skills, and abilities to use those. Um, let me tell you a little story about Letitia. Uh, Letitia... Uh, lives in the Pecan Park neighborhood in southeast Houston. Pecan Park is just inside Loop 610. Uh, in the 2000 census, I wish we had the 2010 uh, census numbers out, but in the 2000 census, uh, Letitia's neighborhood had a per capita income of right at $10,000. The census tract just north of where Letitia lives has a per capita income of $5,000. And uh, Letitia is actually very rich compared to the neighborhood just north of her because Letitia works uh, in a local barbecue restaurant. Uh, she makes $9 an hour. She works about 30 hours a week. And, and she is rich compared to her neighbors. So um, when talking about cell phones, I'm going to be going to Haiti uh, in July. And actually, I'm, I'm excited because of a number of things. I'm going to get out of Houston, going to spend some time doing something I haven't done before. But one of the things that I realized uh, that is good about Haiti, uh, and my wife, in, who is in the room, uh, knows this, is that um, with a little bit of extra money uh, on a data plan, I can talk to, to, I can use my cell phone in Haiti. Uh, I'll be able to access my voice, uh, I'll be able to make phone calls, I'll be able to access my data plan and all of that. The only problem is going to be uh, getting enough electricity. Uh, and one of the things that uh, is apparently a problem in Haiti is people charging cell phones. I, I've talked to a friend who's been to Haiti on a, on a work team there, and, and one of the things that was a, a hot item in their work team is they had a couple of generators, and when they weren't using the generators, everybody would come and plug their cell phones into the generators in order to have access to the electricity that they needed to charge their cell phones. And that's actually an issue around our office in, in Southeast Houston. We have a lot of homeless folks who live in, who are in the area. Uh, and one of the things that they often do, many of them have cell phones as well. You, did you know that? Uh, they have cell phones and, and they are always looking for a place to charge their cell phone. But there are other things that we take for granted as well. Uh, our satellite radios, uh, the, some of us have cars that talk to us and, uh, and show us pictures of where we're going and, and all of that. Uh, I remember when we first started Technology for All in uh, 1997, one of the things that uh, one of our board members uh, was so proud of, uh, some, some of you who are young may not even know what this is, but uh, he got an ISDN connection to his house for the internet. Uh, it was, that was a big deal. In fact, it was show and tell time to show uh, all of his friends how fast his internet connection was at his house. And um, today, we, people in some of these newer subdivisions, they have fiber to the home. And in, in some cases, that's 10,000 times the capacity of what he was so proud of in the mid-1990s. So let me go to the next slide. Um, we just got a smart scale at our house. Anybody have a smart scale? You know what that is? Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, you stand on it, uh, it shows your weight, it shows your body fat, it shows your, uh, your visceral fat. I didn't even know what that was until recently. Um, but, um, but then in the end, the last thing that it shows you is your body age. And I want you to know that I am younger than I look. <laughs> My wife is even younger than she looks. Um, so, uh, actually, that didn't come out right, I don't think, did it? <laughs> Uh, but uh, <laughs> Woo! we're, we're going to be talking about that later. Uh, <laughs> but you get the point. Uh, let, me, let me go on to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> um, the reason I brought up the smart scale is uh, because uh, some of you may know Cliff, Dr. Cliff Dasho. Cliff Dasho is 
um, as a researcher. He, he wears lots of different hats. He works at U of H and at Rice and at Methodist Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. He, he does lots of different things, but the little blue box that he is holding is something that later on in life we may take for granted. Uh, it's, a, it's something that he is doing research on in the neighborhood where our office is. And here in, um, in today's world, one of the things that, uh, that we have is chronic diseases that flood our emergency rooms. And what he has created is a, is a device that allows people with chronic diseases like asthma and heart disease and, uh, and diabetes to send their HIPAA compliant data up through the cloud and then send back a message to the, the end user that says, uh, you need to go to the emergency room, you're just fine, or be careful, you're, in, you're, you're kind of on the edge. So it allows people to take charge of their own medical issues. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that is being tested in our low-income neighborhood that I think will become something that's universal and everybody across uh, the city of Houston will want later on. So uh, let me tell you also about uh, Leo. Leo is one of the kids in the picture here. Uh, Leo uh, came to the United States uh, when he was six months old with his mom. Uh, Leo crossed the border with his mom. He now lives with his uh, mom and his stepfather and his siblings. Leo and his mom are undocumented. Uh, his siblings and his stepfather are documented. Uh, they are U.S. citizens. Well, in the ninth grade, Leo came into our offices where we have a computer center there. And, um, and while he was there, he began to get involved and began to receive some encouragement and, and, uh, and all of that. And, uh, and to make a long story short, Leo has finished Milby High School. He's gone on and he's in college at uh, Texas Southern University. He's a junior there and he is making, I mean, outstanding grades. Uh, what, what, they are, what these kids are doing here is uh, they're preparing mesh boxes, which is a part of our wireless network there in the neighborhood. But another thing that Leo and his friends were involved in is we did a, a research project with Rice testing uh, or letting them use smartphones. And what uh, the Rice researchers were trying to do is to see which apps on the phones people were using the most to try to help researchers understand what, what are the new things that they want to put in smartphones in order to, to make them usable and, and uh, make them interesting to the consumer. And one of the things that we discovered is that Leo and his friends were using their smartphones, get this, they were using their smartphones to write their papers, their high school writing assignments. Can you imagine taking your smartphone out and writing a paper on it? Then what they would do is they would email their pa paper from their smartphone to their email address uh, and then print it out in our computer center either there at our office or go to the library at Milby High School and print out their paper. Can you imagine writing a paper on your smartphone? Man. So let me go to the next slide. There are three things that you have to have in order to be included in the digital world. You have to have bandwidth, you have to have a device, and you have to have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to use that device. Uh, one of the things that we did when, when Houston responded to uh, the needs of our Katrina evacuees, uh, our organization set up three computer centers in the Astrodome complex. Uh, and our goal was to help people find their loved ones and also to help them access the services that, that they needed. Uh, so we set up, this is one of the computer centers we set up there, and when we first set the computer center up, one of the things that we did is uh, we kind of made an estimate. How, we estimated that we would need about one volunteer for every 15 computers that were in the room. Uh, and we set up 205 computers, so well, you know, uh, maybe 10 or 15 volunteers, that's all we would need, but what we discovered very quickly is something very startling and the startling discovery was that almost every single person that walked in the room to receive services to access the computers was somebody who needed some help because they did not have the knowledge skills and abilities to use those tools that we had brought to their temporary home and this was a startling discovery for us and actually it's a discovery that is more common in low-income neighborhoods because because the things that we take for granted that we use all the time you don't get practice when you don't have them. So let me go to the next slide. 40% of Texans are estimated to not have the right combination of bandwidth, tools, devices, and the knowledge, skills, and ability to use those tools in order to participate fully in today's digital world. There's no, we have to have a combo plate. You've got to have all of these things. You've got to have knowledge, you've got to have devices, and you have to have bandwidth. All of those things are required. 
I mentioned earlier that uh, neighborhood just north of where Letitia lives that has a $5,000 per capita income in 2000. That's four miles southeast of downtown. If you go four miles west from downtown, you're in River Oaks. In 2000, the River Oaks uh, uh, area had about $100,000 per capita income. In a low-income neighborhood, what's a person to do when they're working two jobs to try to make ends meet and put food on the table for their kids? It's a tough situation. 70% of the people that come into public computer centers say to us that is their primary means of accessing the internet. It's their primary means of participating in today's digital world. And so what we do in terms of public computer centers and providing those in low-income neighborhoods is incredibly important. This is Letitia. Remember we talked about her earlier? Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about her story. In a project with Rice University, Letitia is now the first residential user in the United States of a new, the new white space that was vacated when analog TVs uh, came, dig, became digital. The FCC opened the, that spectrum in December for folks to begin to develop devices that would allow the, the transmission of Wi-Fi signals through that, that space that our television channels formerly use. And Letitia became the first person in the United States to be a residential user of that space, primarily because of a research project that Rice is doing in our neighborhood that not only provides uh, advancements of the technology in the field, but also provides a community benefit. Our hope is to have the whole neighborhood eventually lit up with white space Wi-Fi. And the neat thing about it, you know, she lives in the Pecan Park neighborhood, and one of the things that we've learned about Wi-Fi when you have a, a large Wi-Fi network is that in that neighborhood, in the, we actually started the network in the wintertime. What do pecan trees do in the winter? They drop their leaves, you're exactly right. And so when we, when we put the Wi-Fi network up, we started doing all the calc, I'm not a technology guy, I'm, I'm more of the big picture guy, but when the, the Rice guys started putting up their network and doing all the calculations, they figured out how far the antennas needed to be apart and all this kind of stuff, and it worked wonderfully. But then spring came, <laughs> and the leaves came out. Um, and so Wi-Fi, in the 90211 space is a difficult project because the conditions are always changing, but the new white space Wi-Fi, just like television signals, goes through walls, goes through trees, goes through, goes through all kinds of things. And actually, Letitia, she's borrowing a Rice uh, iPad there, uh, Letitia has uh, better bandwidth and better throughput than many folks all across the city because, I mean, it just booms through her, through her house, through all the trees and so forth and so on. So, can we achieve digital inclusion? I believe that we can, but we have to work together. So let me talk to you about some ways that you can do that. I want to encourage you to support your public computer center, wherever it is, in your neighborhood, and the city that you're at. Uh, public computer centers are in all kinds of places. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I want to invite you to encourage continued research in fields that will also have a community benefit. The neat thing about the relationship that we have with Rice University in this project uh, is that they are advancing the field in terms of the knowledge and, and all of that, but there is a community benefit from, that comes from them doing what they do in terms of research out in the community. Another thing I invite you to do is to, to recycle. When you get rid of your devices, don't just throw them in the trash. If they've reached the end of their useful life, recycle them responsibly. But if they haven't reached the end of their useful life, recycle them by, by sharing them with a community organization uh, that can perhaps use them as a learn and earn tool. Uh, now, granted, some of us uh, use our devices until they are absolutely dead, but we don't want your dead stuff. Uh, but, uh, but there are community organizations that do learn and earn programs where things that still have a useful life can be used to incentivize young people like Leo and others uh, to finish school and, and work hard and that sort of thing. Another thing I would encourage you to volunteer. Uh, there are lots of places around town that need your training skills, that need your computer mentor skills and all of that. These are things that you can do very easily. And then the last thing I invite you to do is to engage your, your friends, to engage public policymakers, to continue to support digital inclusion activities. I think it's an incredibly important part of what we do as a community and as, as a country. This is a picture of, um, it was mentioned earlier, the Texas Connects Coalition. 
we have 70 sites across the, uh, the, the state that we're working with. Some of these down uh, in the lower part here are down in Duval County, a very, very poor county, very rural area. Um, but I just put that picture up there to say that there are public computer centers all across the state, all across the city. They're not they don't have to be our public computer centers, but they're in libraries, they're in faith-based organizations, they're in community organizations, wherever they are. I invite you to, to figure out a way where you can help uh, bring some digital inclusion to your community. Thank you very much. It's been good to be here. I've enjoyed being with you. Mm -hmm.